Well, it's panic selling in the Chinese stock markets the last couple of days. Although the Hang Seng Index is only down 16%, but certain companies, especially in technology, uh, the internet sector are down like 40, 50%. Education companies in China down 80 to 90%. Why is this happening? It's because all thanks to the government, right? The Chinese Communist Party, they're really cracking down on all these industry, imposing fines, banning certain activities, imposing... Uh, certain regulations. So as an investor, what should you do? Should you, you know, panic and sell like everyone else, get out while I still can? Or should you hold your stocks or should you buy more stocks? Should you be greedy when others are fearful? So in this video, I'll be breaking down this entire crisis. So why are they doing this? We're going to, you know, explore why is the government doing this? What's their end game? How am I managing my own portfolio? And as typical investors, should you be taking advantage of this? Should you be buying stocks at these discounts or should you just be staying away because it's not worth the risk? Let's break it down in this video. So before we begin, let me remind you that in Chinese, the word crisis is called wei ji, which is made of two root words, which is Wei, which means danger, and Qi, which means opportunity. So what does it mean? It means that in any crisis, you've got to be aware of the danger. You can get hurt, but at the same time, recognize the opportunity because in every crisis, there's an opportunity. So let's take a look at a timeline about what the government has been doing and how it's been cracking down on these different industries. So all this started last year in 2020 when they uh, halted the and IPO of Alibaba. So Ant is the fintech business of Alibaba because they said you're violating certain uh, financial technological laws in China. Although I do believe that is because Ant was posing a, a threat to the Chinese banks of which the government has a big stake in it. So it's like, don't screw with my banks, okay? Well, then the second thing was they fined Alibaba about $2.8 billion. Seems like a lot, but in terms of a per share basis, it's actually very small. It's like a slap on the wrist. They fined Alibaba for unfair monopolistic practices. For example, in Alibaba, what it did was they told their merchants, if you sell with us, you can't sell on other e-commerce platforms. You can't sell on Pintuotuo, you can't sell on JD.com. You can only sell with us. So the government felt that that was really unfair. That was unfair monopolistic practices. So they say stop that. And again, they give them a fine, although it's a very small fine. So these are the two main things that uh, they did to Alibaba. The fine and stopping them from uh, making merchants sell exclusively on their platforms. So as a result, since last year, Alibaba's down like 41% from the high. Then they started going after other internet companies. So they then went after Tencent. Tencent is the largest social media company in China. It's kind of like your Facebook and your PayPal put together. And Tencent is also the largest uh, video game, uh, online video game company in the world, not in China, in the world, all right? So they went after Tencent for a couple of things. Number one was they blocked a merger of Taoyi and Huya, which are the two largest video streaming companies in China. They blocked the merger. Because they said if they merge, they'll be like 70% market share, that would kill all the competition. So they killed that merger. So Tencent owns a 30% stake in both of them. So they killed that, so that's one thing. Second thing was they fined Tencent recently uh, for allowing sexually exploitive content of minors on their, on their, their apps, all right? And most recently, what happened was uh, the government ordered Tencent Music Entertainment, which is a subsidiary of Tencent, uh, to end its exclusive music licensing deals with global record labels. And they fined them $77,000, which again, it's a pittance, right? So, okay. So that's what they did. And Tencent's share price is down 40% from the high because of all these fines and regulations. And of course, there were a lot of other stuff. The next one is, of course, uh, DD. So DD is the largest ride-hailing app in China. It's kind of like the Uber of China. And they recently went IPO. They listed on the US Stock Exchange. Now, a few days after they listed, China said, wait a minute, you have been illegally collecting user data and violating 
data protection rules according to the cybersecurity laws of China. So all your apps are suspended and we are launching a full investigation. We're going to fine you. And so because of that, DD, since it when IPO is down like 56% from the IPO price. And most recently, they went after the private education companies in China and they said that, you know, you guys are creating undue stress and pressure on the kids. You are charging exorbitant fees. And because of that, parents can't afford the tutoring and they don't have kids anymore and it's creating a societal fracture. And, you know, because of that, no more profits for you guys, right? So all education companies teaching the curriculum has to be non-profit and you can't take foreign capital um, and no more tutoring on weekends and vacations, no more tutoring for kids under six years old. So basically the government's new policy has killed the entire private education sector. So sure enough, the share prices of these companies have fallen like 90 to 95%. So with all this, a lot of investors are panicking. It's like, who's next? Who's next to get whacked? Is my company gonna go to zero? And they are freaking out, they are panic selling. And a lot of people are going, they're looking at the government going, what the fuck are you doing? Are you crazy? Why are you killing your own companies? Why are you killing your own market? What do you want? <laughs> so here's the thing. We have to understand the government. What's their end game? Why are they doing what they're doing? And only then can you make money in China. There's an old saying by Sun Tzu, the art of war, this military general. And he said that you have to know your enemy and know yourself and you can fight a hundred battles without disaster. So to us investors, the Chinese government is kind of like the enemy, right? Like the enemy. So you got to understand where they're coming from. At the same time, understand yourself as an investor. What's your strategy? What's your investment strategy? And only then can you uh, build your wealth without disaster. So let's really understand uh, what's going on here. When you invest in China, you have to understand it's a totally different political system. It's a totally different game. Like in the US, they know that big technology companies are also exploiting loopholes. They are also having a lot of unfair monopolistic practices. But the US government can't do shit, right? Because of their democracy, they debate till, till the cows come home. And a lot of politicians, they are in the pockets of these wealthy entrepreneurs. They are controlled by them through lobbying. So the US government, government can't do anything, right? So it's like run free, run free. In China, it's different. In China, remember that it's an authoritarian government. It's a communist country where the government has absolute power over the private sector. And it can push through any regulation they want anytime they want to do it. That's the first thing to understand. The second thing is that the Chinese government would always put national interests above individual interests. It means in China, yeah, you can get rich, you can get wealthy, but if you become too powerful and it goes against the nat national security or interest, we will kill you. <laughs> now think about it, right? Imagine you're the Chinese government and you say to Alibaba, you know what? We elbowed out Google. We elbowed out Facebook. We elbowed out PayPal. We got rid of all the competition so you are the monopoly. And Alibaba goes, yeah, I'm the monopoly, right? But they got too arrogant, they got too big. And when Alibaba started controlling all the data of all the citizens and co started controlling the financial system, the Chinese government said, no, 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 no. I got rid of all these people and now you want to play punk with me? Now you think you're bigger than me? So that's how Alibaba got fined and that's how they are now forced to play by the rules of the government. The other thing to understand is that in China, the government wants to balance capitalism, economic growth with socialism, which is the good of the people. So yes, they want economic growth and for that to happen, they need people to be wealthier. And that's why they need these companies to keep growing and to generate more and more profit. So they won't kill these companies. They want the companies to succeed. But at the same time, they have to ensure that the man on the street is not hurt. So they enact these regulations to protect the citizens. Like antitrust regulations that can create unfair pricing in the future and hurt the people. At the end of the day, we can be rewarded handsomely investing in China and riding on China's growth and wealth. But at the same time, you have to understand which companies to invest in and you have to understand the regulatory risk. These regulations may hurt the market in the short term, but they will create more sustainable growth in the long run. So. When we invest in China, we cannot use the Western playbook. We have to understand the regulatory risk 
and to do our best to avoid the risk in order to generate those profits. When investing in China, you have to understand the five main regulatory risks. The first is a risk of antitrust crackdown. So this is where the government wants to stop unfair monopolistic practices by certain companies. And there are not many companies that are monopolies. So basically, you've got Alibaba, you've got Tencent, you've got Meituan, and maybe JD or Pintuoto to name a few. So I own these big tech giants. Am I concerned about this antitrust crackdown? Not at all. And the reason is this. I think that these regulations to prevent unfair monopolistic practices, I think is good for the long-term growth and health of the industry. So I don't have a problem with it. And although they are putting certain uh, regulations like preventing certain mergers and stopping Alibaba from exclusive arrangements with their merchants, I don't think it's going to really affect the dominant positions of these companies uh, significantly. Why? Because Alibaba is already a huge market share leader. They've got a wide economic mode. They've over 60% market share. Same thing with Tencent. So all these things would benefit uh, newer companies, but it will not significantly alter the competitive advantage of these tech giants. So this is something that I'm uh, not concerned about at all. The second risk are with companies that pose a cybersecurity threat to the Chinese government and to the national security of China. So basically, they are concerned that certain companies like DD, which is a right healing app, and they collect data of millions and millions of citizens. And by listing on the US exchange and being audited, for example, or some oversight by the foreign government, they are afraid that this uh, data, this big data of citizens in China will fall into foreign hands. So Chinese government wants to ensure that companies that uh, manage all this data, the data stays in China. And for companies that uh, do not follow these regulations, they'll be harshly punished by the Chinese government. And this is exactly what happened to Didi. In fact, the government told Didi that uh, to delay the IPO because they were violating certain cybersecurity laws and they were not handling the private data of their customers properly. But DD basically went ahead anyway with the IPO and gave a middle finger to the Chinese government. So now the government is really pissed off and they're really going to, uh, you know, get DD for this. So that's why for certain com companies like DD, I would stay away and I wouldn't dare to invest in them, right? So like I said, you have to know which companies uh, are real trouble and which companies which are pretty safe. Now, the third uh, risk you have to understand is, now this risk doesn't come from the Chinese government, it comes from the US government. So recently, last year, the US government has passed a new bill, which is the Holding Foreign Companies Accountable Act, right? Now, this law states that uh, companies, specifically Chinese companies, that are listed on the US stock exchanges they have to declare that they are not owned or controlled by any foreign government. Now, that's going to be tricky because I can tell you that most of the Chinese companies are controlled indirectly by the Chinese government. At the same time, these Chinese companies listed on the US exchange, they have to be audited by the PCAOB, which is the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, for three consecutive years. They must have their accounts being audited by this board and if they are not, these companies, companies will be banned from trading and delisted from the US stock exchanges. So here's the problem. The US government is saying that these Chinese companies who are listed on the US exchange, they must be audited by US authorities or they will be delisted in three years. But the Chinese government will not allow that to happen because they would not want the US government to audit their companies and be privy to a lot of sensitive data. Now, currently, let's take a look at this. Currently, there are about 248 Chinese companies listed on the US exchanges with a total market capitalization of $2.1 trillion. So, what's going to happen? In the worst case scenario, if the US government delist all the Chinese companies from the US exchanges, uh, that could create a major blow to investors. They'll lose a lot of money and it's going to be a huge impact on the financial markets. Will the US government do this? I'm not sure. I think it's unlikely 
but you never know. And that's why personally for me, when I invest in Chinese companies, I avoid the Chinese companies listed on the US markets through ADRs, American Depository Receipts. I feel more comfortable own, owning Chinese companies listed directly on the Hong Kong exchange or listed on the Shanghai exchange. Now, if for some reason you're not able to invest in the Hong Kong or Shanghai stocks uh, because your broker doesn't allow you to, then my suggestion would be in the long run, it is safer to own Chinese ETFs, exchange traded funds, where they own the companies that are listed on Hong Kong and Shanghai rather than owning the ones listed in the US because there is a risk. They could be forced to delist from the markets and if they are forced to delist, as an investor, you may have problems getting your money back. Again, this is a small risk, but it could happen. Now, there's a fourth risk you have to be aware about, which is what we call the variable interest entity risk or VIE risk. Now, this applies to, again, China stocks listed on the US markets. Now, first you have to understand that according to Chinese law, foreigners are not allowed to own Chinese companies in sensitive sectors like internet business, okay? So how was Alibaba and Tencent and JD.com, which are internet companies, how do they get foreigners to own their shares? Well, they created a loophole. And what they did was they created a VIE structure to bypass this Chinese regulation. So what they did was this. So for example, this is the actual Alibaba, for example, down here. This is the Alibaba company. Now again, as foreigners, you can't legally own shares in the actual Alibaba company. So what they do is they create another company, which is a wholly foreign-owned enterprise in China, and another shell company, which is in the Cayman Islands, all right? And so what happens is that using a bunch of contracts and agreements, uh, when you buy the Alibaba in the US, you're not actually buying the real Alibaba. You're actually buying shares in a Cayman registered shell company that owns another foreign uh, company in China that has got contracts and agreements with the actual Alibaba company. <laughs> I know it sounds a bit complicated, but basically they did this to bypass this Chinese regulation. So I have to tell you that technically this is in a gray area. It is not technically 100% legal. So again, understand that if you own US lit listed shares in Alibaba or Tencent or JD or Pintuoto, you don't actually own shares in the real company you own the depository receipts in a company that has a contract with the Chinese firm that promises to deliver the portion of profits to the Chinese firm. Now, here's the uh, scary thing. You have to understand that shareholders in these VIE structures own no real assets and you have no legal recourse should the Chinese decide to void the whole situation, or the Chinese parent company decides to move assets elsewhere. So in the worst case scenario, if the Chinese government were to play bastard and they say, well, I'm sorry, this VIE structure is illegal. Everyone who owns US uh, listed Baba or Tencent or Pintuoto, you actually don't own anything. You have got no legal recourse. You are actually owning a shell company. All right? So now, will the Chinese government do this? I doubt so. If, if they do this, they're going to basically destroy their reputation in the world and their whole financial market is going to suffer. So I don't think they're going to do this. But again, there is a very small risk if they uh, pursue this nuclear option. And that's why I keep telling people that if you want to invest in China stocks and you want to be 100% safe, buy the actual Chinese shares listed on Hong Kong or Shanghai and not the ones listed in the US because you're not really buying the company, you're just buying a shell company with agreements with the real company. The fifth risk is that in China, any business that is detrimental to the social good of the country will get whacked eventually. Like, I never invested in the Chinese education companies like EDU or TAL. And the reason is because I myself I am in the education business in Singapore. I own many learning centers where we tutor kids in English and mathematics. So I understand the business and industry very well. 
And the reason I didn't invest in the Chinese companies was I felt um, uncomfortable. And the reason is because, again, the Chinese education companies, they overly pressure the students there. They hard sell them uh, tutoring packages. They jack up the prices. And a lot of students there, you know, they study like crazy and they are suicidal, many of them. And a lot of parents, uh, they can't afford to have kids. So I felt it was really, really unsustainable. And that's why I stayed away from those stocks. And thank goodness, because now they've collapsed, right? So again, I say, if you want to invest in China, you have to really understand the business you're buying. You have to really understand the industry that it's in. And if you, and if you actually understand uh, what's happening in China, you know that it was not a sustainable situation and this crackdown on the education companies was a long time coming. Just to share with you, if you read some of these Twitter feeds, you understand what's actually going on in the education industry over there. All right, it's like, it says over here, right? Like this guy, he says, and he's referring to his uh, teenage cousin, a uh, student, right? He's done nothing since the age of six other than study. I was saddened seeing just how messed he became as a product of the education system being wired to do nothing other than mindless studying, so much so that he had trouble picking out his own clothes in the morning, even at age 18. I saw my aunt burn through her paycheck to send her son uh, through after-school programs just so he's not disadvantaged relative to other kids. Ironically, regular schools became a sideshow while after-school programs became the main battleground for kids. Uh, my cousin would sleep through regular school so he can have enough energy left for after-school programs and many regular school teachers complained and they left their jobs to teach after school because of the better pay. It affected the system in a major way. So basically, the private education system was really screwing up the uh, public system and again, causing parents to overpay for tu tutoring and all these things. And that's what caused the government to step in to stop all these things. Not because they are bastards or they want to hurt investors, but they had to balance the societal good with capitalism. So as you guys know, I've always been investing in China as part of my overall investment strategy. So let me share with you what's my strategy moving forward. If you take a look at my portfolios, China makes up roughly about 20% of my overall portfolio. The other 80% being US companies. So the recent sell-off in Chinese stocks has definitely impacted my portfolio's value in the last couple of days. Uh, if you take a look at my... Uh, right now, my up-to-date, uh, year-to-date performance, you can see um, it's up about 21.41% uh, from January to July for the year. Now, this was actually close to like 28% return for the first seven months, but because of the sell-off, it's down 8 percentage points and I'm only up 21% for the year. So uh, that's the impact that the China stocks sell-off has had on my portfolio. Uh, if you take a look, uh, I'm owning Tencent, Alibaba, and JD. And for Tencent, my uh, average price was 389, uh, and now it's down to 450. It was at 700, so it's, it dropped a lot and reducing my profit temporarily. For Alibaba, my average price is 217, uh, and now it's 180, so I'm currently down like 18% below my purchase price. And as an investor, that's fine, because as long as you know it's a great company, it's undervalued, it will rebound eventually. It's going to double and triple in the future, so short term, it's a bit down, uh, no worries, mate. All right? And like JD.com, I'm also slightly below my average price of 290, now it's like 247. And again, note that my Chinese companies I own are the ones in, on Hong Kong. Uh, I've got ETFs like the ASHR uh, and the GXE China ETFs listed on the US markets and they are still um, higher than my average price because I bought them some time ago, uh, but it's been down quite a lot since the last couple of months. So you can see if you add up like for Tencent, I've got a 4% exposure, right? Alibaba, 5% exposure, JD.com, 1% exposure. For my China ETFs, 5% and 1.65%. So if you add it all together, basically my Chinese exposure is 22% right now. So what's really important is as an investor, 
you must always diversify your portfolio and not put too much into one uh, sector or one industry or one country if it is a, a developing emerging market. So I always tell people that don't have more than 25% exposure to emerging markets, uh, China or anything like that. So this ensures that when it's a sell-off, your portfolio doesn't get too badly hurt in the short term. So what's my strategy moving forward? Am I going to buy more shares now that it's cheaper? Am I holding or am I going to sell anything? Now, as an investor, your decision about whether to buy, hold or sell must be based on understanding the business behind the stock and not just selling because you get emotional and you panic and oh my God. And the worst time to sell is when you're panicking and when you're emotional because you tend to sell right at the bottom and the moment you sell, it bounces back up again. So you got to be cool about it, right? So even if the price is way below your purchase price or it's way down from the high, you got to look at it logically from the business, business perspective. So the first question to ask would be, okay, so from the regulations and the policy changes, how has it significantly altered the fundamentals of the business? So based on what the government has done, has it changed the fundamental business of Alibaba, of Tencent, of Didi, of Pintuotuo, of JD, of the Chinese education companies? And if so, by how much? All right, so that's the first question to ask. The second question would be, currently are the shares of the business significantly undervalued or are they still overvalued? And the last question would be, will these companies continue to grow? over time? Will they be worth a lot more six months, a year, two years from now? So the answer depends on the individual company. So I'm just going to give you a few examples. I won't go through all the companies. I'll just go through some of the companies. And let's begin with Alibaba. So Alibaba is the biggest e-commerce company in China. They've got over 60% market share and they're also into the cloud enterprise. So uh, currently the uh, the price is down about 41% from the high. As I'm speaking right now, it's still going down in the market. So maybe it's down to about 42 or 43% from the high right now. And if you calculate the intrinsic value, I'm not going to go into that, but basically that's what we do in our programs. Now, even taking into account uh, that they are no longer having exclusive merchants, taking into account that uh, certain regulations were imposed on them, no more NIPO, the valuation I get is still about um, 313 US dollars for the US Baba shares. And for the ones on Hong Kong exchange, I value it at about $303, taking into account all the regulatory actions. So currently it's trading at, well, when I took the screen captures about 191, right now I think it's down to like 180, went down a bit more. So currently, it's like about 40, 40 to 43% undervalued right now. So am I going to sell Alibaba? Of course not. Why? Because it's still a great business, right? The sales are growing, profits are growing, cash flow is growing. It's got huge cash. It's got low debt. It's a great business. And to me, this sell-off is purely irrational. It's purely irrational panic. Now, I'm not saying it can't go lower. Of course, it can go lower. In fact, when does the price bottom? The price bottoms when there are no more sellers left. When are there no more sellers left? When the last person who wanted to sell has sold. And we call that capitulation. So capitulation is when the weak holders, they panic, they give up, they sell. And once everyone who wanted to sell has sold, then it bottoms. So it may bottom today, it may bottom tomorrow. I don't know when it's going to bottom, right? But eventually it will bottom. And over time, it is going to go back uh, way above its intrinsic value of $303. So for this guy, I'm holding it. Will I be buying more? I won't be buying more. Why? Because I already have a 5% allocation in my portfolio and that's my maximum allocation. But if I didn't have a 5% allocation, I would buy more to that allocation. So the important thing is diversification. Always have a fixed maximum allocation of a stock in your portfolio. Once you reach that maximum, you don't add more shares. You just you know, hold it until it eventually goes a lot higher. Uh, that's Alibaba. Now for Tencent, um, it's also 
drop from the high. Right now, I think it's dropped to like 450 as well. So it's about, you know, 42% from the high. The intrinsic value is about 733 Hong Kong dollars. And again, this is taking into account all the regulations and fines imposed upon them. And based on their intrinsic value, they are still 37% undervalued. So for Tencent, I think it's a great company. And again, I'm not uh, selling anything. In fact, I may be buying a bit more Tencent because I'm slightly below 5%. So I may add a bit more shares to get back to a 5% allocation. If you look at past crashes of the stock, you can see that uh, this was back in 2018 when they, uh, their, their video games were banned temporarily by the Chinese government at the time, uh, the price fell 47% from the high before it eventually bottomed and it went back up, right? So remember that every panic will end, every crisis will end. And when it ends, it will eventually rebound to what is the fair value. So you got to uh, understand that, right? So right now it's down like 40%, 45%. It may go down a bit more all the way down here. You never know. But eventually when it bottoms, it's going to be a huge upside for Tencent Holdings. And if you take a look at Alibaba, you can see that, again, previous crashes. This was down 53% back in 2015. And in 2018, 2019, it was down like 39%. So, so far down about 45%. Again, it could go a bit lower, even down to 50%. You never know. But again, if you understand the fundamentals of the business, you're cool with it, right? You don't freak out, you don't sell, just hold it, it's gonna go back higher again. And again, does it apply for all companies? Do we hold all companies? No. So for example, DD, now I don't own DD shares because in the first place, I never liked the business model, right? To me, Uber and Grab and all these right hailing apps, they're in a very, very low profit margin industry and they compete with public transport. So I never liked the business model in the first place. So I never bought it, right? Um, but if I did own it, for example, I wouldn't want to hold on to it for too long. I want to get out, right? But again, uh, I always learned that if you want to sell a stock because it's a lousy business, uh, don't sell at the low. Remember, nothing drops in a straight line. It will like drop, it go up, it drop, it goes up. So wait for a bit of a rally to get out if you don't believe in the business anymore. Personally, for me, like I said, I don't own this and I wouldn't want to own this. Uh, or even though it is slightly undervalued. Why? Because DD, first of all, is not making money. It doesn't have consistent profits. I don't think it's got a strong mode. But in addition, um, the Chinese government is really pissed off at them because they kind of like went against their advice of going IPO without clearing their cybersecurity uh, uh, violations. And you can see China's regulators suspect DD's US listing was a deliberate act of deceit, a portrayal that shows severity of mistrust. Uh, and DD is at a risk of unprecedented penalties. So the government is now thinking about how to punish them and they said it's going to be unprecedented. So it could be anything from a huge fine to forced delisting to withdrawal of their US shares. So no idea how it's going to play out. It could get really ugly. So uh, I wouldn't hold on to DD uh, personally. All right. So again, there are many, many examples. Uh, I can't go through all of them, but those are a few examples. Finally, in the edutech company or the private education company, um, I think it's over. I think because of the regulations, they have completely dismantled their business model. So I don't think those companies like EDU or TAL, I don't think they're ever going to get back. I don't think they're ever going to be where they were in the past. So I don't hold those stocks. And I, if I did hold them, I, I wouldn't have much hope in them in the future, right? So it depends on the individual companies. So let me summarize this pretty long video uh, with this statement. Should you own Chinese stocks? Yes, you can make a lot of money, but you could lose money as well if you run foul of these regulations. So number one, only own Chinese stocks if you truly understand the underlying business. That you know it's a great business, it's got a white mode, and it's not going to uh, go against any of those risks and regulations I talked about. Okay, and if you're not confident enough to pick the right companies, because there are so many of them, if you're not confident, 
then the best thing to do to gain exposure to Chinese markets is to buy the Chinese ETFs, exchange traded funds. But to ensure that the ETFs you buy, the companies they hold are not listed on the US markets, or not too many of them at least. Uh, because again, remember that these US listed ADRs uh, are constructed using those VIE structures, which are technically illegal. And uh, the US government could also force them to delete. So there's, there's a bit of risk over there. So I'd rather hold ETFs that own Chinese companies that are listed on Hong Kong or Shanghai. By owning ETFs, we eliminate company-specific risk. The final thing to always understand is that in investing in any market or any company, never put all your eggs in one basket because you never know what's going to happen. Okay, Always diversify to ensure that uh, each company and each sector has a small allocation. So if shit happens, your portfolio will still grow, your wealth will still grow every single year. All right, so it's all about diversification. And again, finally, remember that um, although the risk is small, it's always safest to hold the Chinese companies listed in Hong Kong or Shanghai because you own the actual shares of the company. So I hope this presentation has been useful. It's been eye-opening. And if you've got questions, do ask them in the comment section. I'll do my best to answer them in the next couple of days. Uh, this is Adam Koo and being a markets be with you. If you want to catch my latest videos, click on the subscribe button right now. Click on the bell so you get instant notifications once I upload my latest video. If you want to check out my online courses, go to piranaprofits.com. We're going to learn how to invest and how to trade the financial markets and create an income from all around the world. If you want to join my live Wealth Academy program, go on to wealthacademyglobal.com and find out more about how you can learn investing and trading live online. This is Adam Koo and may the markets be with you.